G'day guys, I'm here with Arthur Luxburg, who is from the C++ team over in Redmond, and he's been working on the next version of C++, and he's graciously uh, volunteered to come out and be interviewed by SSW TV. How are you, Arthur? I'm pretty good. It's, it's Arthur, actually, but that's Arthur, fine. right, yeah. okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's an American thing. Everybody in Seattle talks like I do. So right, okay. Like so, uh, you're from Estonia? I'm originally from Estonia, but I've been working for Microsoft for the last 12 years. Right. Uh, mostly doing C++. Right, so I've got you here for to talk about C++. Yes. I thought it was dead. Uh, you know, many people thought that, but uh, I'm here to prove, it, prove you that it's actually still alive and uh, right. alive, alive and kicking. Okay. Much so. so I believe that um, C++ is back from the dead and it's um, alive and kicking in Visual Studio 11. Absolutely. And now it's a valid choice in certain scenarios. Absolutely. Where we want real power. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And you know what, I would start with uh, how much I actually love C Sharp and manage code. I've been a C Sharp programmer for several years now. This is an absolutely perfect, uh, it's a great language for a uh, line of business applications right. and that kind of stuff. But uh, about C++. Let's talk about C why C++ is relevant again. Many of you guys must, must have uh, heard about this so-called renaissance, C++ renaissance or resurgence of, new, of interest in C++. Yes. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, like I said, managed, managed code is great, absolutely great for line of business applications and that kind of stuff. But you also have to think about what are you optimizing for in your application? Are you optimizing for the developer time? Are you optimizing for the power? And specifically, uh, C++ is becoming more relevant again because right. of the advent of, uh, of the cloud and the mobile devices. That's right, so um, I would say at SSW we typically optimize for developer time until we get that piece where the right. client wants that piece faster. Right. And you know what? It was true uh, in the past where you were taught that C++ is a, is a big, ugly language that fights you in, in every way. But it doesn't have to be this way. And with C++11, it's just not the case anymore. It's a, it's a thoroughly modern language. Uh, it, you get performance and you get, you get productivity. You basically get the best of, the, of both worlds. So what has made Microsoft um, start putting a lot of investments into C++ and Visual Studio and C++ instead of you know, just going down the C-sharp road like we've been going for a long time? You know what, Microsoft never really stopped investing in C++. Microsoft runs on C++. Right. Most of the critical applications and platforms in C++, such as Windows, hmm. uh, Office, SQL Server Engine, they all run on C++ and they will continue to run on C++. Okay. As we, uh, as we build our software, it's inevitable that we have to build abstractions, layers of abstractions, yeah. just because our brains are wired in this way that we cannot, they have a limited capacity, we cannot comprehend big, complicated things. And C++ is the, the king of the low-cost abstraction. Right. Right? Every time you add an abstraction layer, typically you have to pay for it. But with C++, this is typically not the case. So when uh, you started building all of these apps for Windows Phone 7, are they all built in C++, the majority of them? Uh, not yet, right. not yet, but uh, uh, we are making it, we are making it possible. So a lot of the ones that are, that are already out uh, in C Sharp? Windows, uh, for Windows 7 and Windows 8, uh, C Sharp remains one of the main languages and uh, we're also making uh, a big investment into C++ and making C++, C++ the first uh, the first class language for, uh, for programming. So can I ask, uh, part of the um, motivation for Microsoft to invest in here, has this come from seeing what's been happening on iOS and the success of Objective-C? We're, you know, we're, we're looking at many things in, in Microsoft and um, uh, like I said, C++, we never really stopped investing in C++, right. but what has become important is uh, the power that C++ brings, and it's in, in two areas. It's one of them is the cloud mm -hmm. on the data center. Yes. Most of the most of the cost that you pay on the cloud is is the power, right? right? And on the mo mobile devices, power is important because it affects your battery life. Right. And so, if you want to optimize for developer for the developer time, managed language is your uh, is your choice. Okay. But for power extensive, for power greedy applications, C is absolutely the best. Right. So that's the main motivation. When we build an app in C or a part in C uh, how come it uses much less battery? Well, because the main one of the main design principles of C was pay for play. As we build those layers of abstractions. 
uh, C++ has always been designed so that if you're not using a particular feature in the language, you're not paying for it, right. which is not the case in many managed languages where you simply cannot opt out of garbage collection, you cannot out opt out of metadata, JIT compilation, etc. Right. With C++, it's as close to the metal as possible. There is so, no other language between C++ right. and the silicon. Okay. So C Sharp is pay for everything, and C++ is pay for each section as you go. I wouldn't say it's pay for everything, but in C++, in, in C Sharp, you pay for certain things, even if you're not using them. Right. And in many cases, that's just fine because it doesn't matter, right? Okay. Uh, for C++, you're building, you're building the platform, and that platform can be used in the data center where it's absolutely critical, or it can be used by a grandmother who is using Facebook or Hotmail, in which case it doesn't matter. But okay. just because we don't know, we have to optimize for performance, because okay. if we don't do it, our competitors do it. Okay, so in terms of Visual Studio 11, it, what is the experience like now in there, is it like C Sharp? Uh, it's getting a lot closer to C Sharp. In terms of the Visual Studio experience, uh, we've made some improvements in IntelliSense, mm. uh, we've made some improvements in Object Browser, and debugging experience has all improved. And but autocomplete? In autocompletion as well, yes. Right. This is something that we didn't have in, mm. in Dev10, specifically for uh, Visual C++ CLI, but it's coming back, and we, we listen to our customers. Uh, Oh. Put it back. I thought C++ guys use Notepad all the time. Uh, some of them do, some of them do. But you know what? I use C++ every day, and uh, I am much more productive when I'm in a, inside the Visual Studio environment. When I need to, when I when I need to write a quick snippet of code, okay. I might use something else. But when I'm uh, building Visual Studio, because that's part of what right. I do, we build Visual Studio using Visual Studio. Of okay. course, I'm within Visual Studio, right? Cool. All right. So can I move on to how the performance part? Okay. Mm -hmm. I understand the battery life um, and the and the uh, pay for play. Uh, mm -hmm. Sounds good. But the performance stuff. What is if I just write it in C plus plus? Is it just faster, or what choices do I have? Like in C sharp, we have um, uh, P link, right. uh, which has been semi successful so far. Right. There are many interesting uh, advancements in C++, specifically in the performance area. One of them is, for example, I'm, start with, I'm starting, starting with a random example, vectorizer, auto vectorizer and auto parallelizer. Okay. You do absolutely nothing with your program. You just recompile it, and there's a good chance that if you have a loop, uh, that loop will be parallelized. And so your program will become faster. That's one of the examples. And so, so that makes it um, a lay down reserve to upgrade because yes. you're automatically yes. going to get performance. You automatically get it, yes. And, and so in terms of the performance, are you saying it will take advantage of the CPU and the GPU? Yes, and not only that, it will, it will also take advantage of the vector units inside your CPU. Right, all right, tell me more about that. So let's talk about that. I'll, talk, I'll have a few slides here that demonstrate that. So okay. Uh, but this slide is actually, this slide is a more of an introduction about what is, why C++ is relevant again. Okay. And this slide was, uh, this. Example was created by one of our engineers called uh, Stefan Lavave, and his his task was basically to try to cram as many new C plus plus eleven features as, as can fit on the single slide. So, let's look at this. This is an example where we have a function called flip that yep. takes a string and reverses it. Got it. And in the main function of the application, we have a vector of futures, uh, and you create you create those uh, you create those futures using the async function, and then you uh, print the result on the screen. So, I can't tell what's new and what's not. Uh, that's why that's okay. that's why I'm here to tell you. All right. So the first thing that we're introducing is called it's the C++ standard concept called a future, right? The, think of a future as a ticket redeemable for uh, a type. In this case, it's it's the string, right? Okay. You create a future, it will start running. It will use the concurrency runtime under the, under the covers, and it will use the available cores as many as you have, okay. right? Uh, and eventually it will produce uh, a string. So it's very, it's very useful for CPU intensive computations where you really need to take advantage of multiple cores. Not very motivated in this particular example, but in many cases this is very important. Okay. So that's, that's the future. The next thing is really not really a future, but it's something, something that was uh, uh, somewhat of an embarrassment in C++. And this was, this was something that people who told you that C++ is dead and that C++ fights you in every way, that's the example that they've used. In this case, uh, before C++11, you had to put a space between those two angle brackets, just because the compiler was confusing 
uh, double angle brackets with a with a stream operator. Well, we oh. fixed that, right? It's just it's it's not really a feature. We just fixed that. Sounds like a bug fix. It sounds like <laughs> it's more like a bug fix in the language, but I mean that's a good thing, right? The async function. This is the function that takes uh, a C plus plus lambda expression, and the lambda expression is the is really a way to represent a function in line. Before C plus plus eleven. Every time you would have to uh, implement a function or use that function in a function like sort or QSort, mm -hmm. you would have to write it in one place and then call into that from something, some, some other place. Right. Is that the same as what we have in C Sharp? Uh, C Sharp had this feature for mm -hmm. uh, quite a few years and many other languages have this feature. So C++ is really, C++ is not innovating in that space. You're right? catching up to us. We're catching up, yeah, okay. we're catching up. So it's a lambda. The async function takes the lambda yep. and produces a future and then you're putting that future into the vector. Got it. Next thing is the thing called a uh, range, range-based for, for loop. Uh, what you had to do in the past was uh, you have a vector and you call a for loop on the vector or an std, std for each function giving it the beginning of the vector and the end of the vector. Well, in this case, you can do it much simpler by simply calling the for statement, it's a C++ statement, and giving it the auto. Auto keyword. And for, for those of you listeners who are C, C sharp programmer, programmers, this is really the equivalent of the var keyword right. in, okay. uh, in C++. You don't have to spell out the name, and the name is actually pretty long. If, if you had to spell it out, you'd have to say vector or future of string, colon, colon, iterator. Right? Why spell that? The compiler can just figure it out, and that's what happens here. Okay, all right. So that's uh, lots, of, lots of goodness for C++. Yeah, yeah. And of course, the other thing is the move semantics, right? You were taught previously that be careful with the temporaries in C++. Mm -hmm. Don't pass objects by value. Well, it's not necessarily the case anymore because of this thing called move semantics. Uh, uh, those temporaries just don't exist as often anymore. Uh, you, you, can, you can pass a string uh, to a string, and it will not, instead of creating a temporary, it will simply move the object, which, which can be seen as, a, as an optimization of the copy. Okay. Uh, and then global functions begin and end, and that kind of stuff. So all this thing, all those things are done to uh, make programming in C++ more easy and more productive, and uh, the resulting code is a lot more terse. But also, right. so what what type of numbers? Are, like, how much less code are we writing now? Uh, significantly more. If I had an example that shows the same, uh, the equivalent of the same application using C++ 98, it would probably be. Uh, you know, maybe uh, twice as much code, or you know, really? fifty percent more code. Yes, because of oh. all the things that you have to spell out, because yeah. of things that simply didn't exist in C plus plus ninety eight, such as futures. Right. Okay. Uh, and wow. That's a and huge now you change. can do that. And the important thing is that with futures, they are standard C plus plus. Yes. So you can compile this with Microsoft C plus plus compiler. You go to another platform. You compile it's with GCC. Okay. It's all the same. Okay. It works. All right. So. Arthur, what I'm keen on drilling into is the performance optimizations. So I understand that the vectorizer and parallelizer out of the box improvements. Um, right. We've got more choices as well. Absolutely. So let me tell you first about the vectorizer. Okay. Any modern processor has uh, basically two units, the scalar unit and the vector unit. And uh, until uh, Dev11 compiler came along, we really didn't uh, didn't take advantage of all the vector units available okay. in the processor, uh, and it has changed with Dev11. So on this picture, I have a scalar scalar unit on the CPU, uh, and the vector unit, and the vector unit can take can apply the same operation on uh, multiple different uh, data elements, and so and it all happens during the same instruction. So if you have a data parallel application, for instance, you're going through the array and summing up all the elements. Uh, Using using vector is very appropriate and is very is very beneficial for you because suddenly you're just starting to utilize all of your uh, all of your uh, vector units. Uh, so is this processing happening on the CPU or the GPU? It all happens. It all happens on CPU. So right. far, okay. we're only right. talking about okay. CPU. So, cool. so look at this example. You have an array of uh, four elements. Uh, you have another array of four elements. You are adding them one and you're creating another array that has every element of which contains the sum of the previous two elements. So you're doing four additions in, in, in right. the same instruction, right? And in C-sharp, we could only go through those sequentially? 
In C sharp so far, you can really go through that sequentially, but I'm sure you know languages are catching up, compilers are catching up. It'll become available. So there are two uh, there are two related features here. One is called the auto vectorizer, and the other is auto uh, parallelizer. Auto vectorization is on by default. Right. You don't just have to do anything; okay. just recompile the code, and there is a good chance it will run faster if your application is suitable for that. Auto parallelization is uh, is a feature that you have to turn on mm. either by throwing the compiler switch. And by adding a pragma to the compiler as, as a hint, hey, please try to optimize that loop, and then the compiler will or will not do it. But you can, you certainly have that option. So just uh, back on that one, mm -hmm. um, is it, uh, uh, can you, well, it reminds me a lot of SQL. Mm -hmm. And so you can look at a query plan to see how it's executing well. Right. Can right. you tell, um, even though it's on by default, whether it was used? And can you make yes. some changes yes. to make sure it was Yes, we have we have some uh, profiling tools that right. you can run on your application, and you can you can tell. There are also some patterns that we recommend people to use to make your code friendlier right. to the vectorizer. Okay. So there are certain techniques that you have to apply. And, and the same with the parallelizer, you can the put same. the hint, see if it happens. You can if put it the works. hint. Yes. Right. Okay. But but the key here is uh, correctness. The compiler will never generate incorrect code for you. Okay. So it's very safe, unlike some of the other example or technologies that we've looked we, we will look at in a couple of slides. Oh, okay. All right. So, just just how good is it? How powerful is it? Like, one of the standard examples we call it's called embarrassingly parallel. This is an example where you are uh, applying your computation to uh, parts of your data array, mm -hmm. uh, which are completely not dependent on each other. Is this a Microsoft term? Embarrassingly parallel? No, it's not a Microsoft term. It's a, it's a science, scientific scientific term. It's used uh, it's used extensively in uh, parallel processing. It's okay. called embarrassingly parallel, and that's the top of the chain. That's that's the top of the chain. If okay. your if your loop if the body of your loop is embarrassingly parallel, like I have in this example, then vectorizer will take care of that. Okay. It will also take care of some of the more advanced patterns, like in my second example. But it cannot do miracles. For instance, if you inside your loop, if you have a function that calls into a DLL and that function uh, changes the state of a global variable without locking it, right? Uh, the compiler has to the compiler has to be very conservative. Okay. Correctness is is uh, it comes first, and right. so it will not it will not paralyze that code. As well as some of the examples that have loop carry dependencies, dependencies like I have uh, in my last example. Okay. But it keeps getting better. This is just the first version of the vectorizer. Future versions of the vectorizer will pick up more and more ah, patterns. Ah, right. Okay. So just this keep you know just keep start, using right. it. Keep uh, okay. keep keep trying it and see if it goes makes better. The other thing that we've invested in heavily is support for building Metro-style applications. That's right. That's why we're talking. <laughs> That's why we're talking, yes. Windows 8 is important, and we in Visual C++ want to make sure that C++ remains relevant yes. in Windows 8. And so we've added some extensions to the language to, to, make, uh, to make it easier for C++ developers to take advantage of the new Windows 8 runtime and to make it easier for people to build Metro-style applications. So this is just the normal runtime that the C Sharp guys use as well. This is the same runtime right. that C Sharp guys can okay. also use as okay. well, right? But uh, we've made we've added some extensions to make it easier to use from C plus plus. Right. So we've added C plus plus extensions. It's, it's is... those are C plus plus extensions. Those are Microsoft extensions, right? You only have to use them around the boundaries of your code, where your code interacts with right. uh, with other languages in the runtime. But the vast majority of your code. Can remain standard C plus plus C right. plus eleven. So this is the aid productivity. I, I assume. This is just the productivity. So with yes. the C plus purists say, don't use this. Just use generic C plus right, code. Right. right. Okay. And so and they will be absolutely correct. You can still do that, except for those areas around the boundaries where you have to interact okay. with Windows Okay. Okay. Right. Can you just give us a couple of examples? Of let's look at let's look at some let's look at some of the features that we've added. So okay. there are some there are some uh, keywords that we added to. Uh, to qualify data types like a ref class, okay. value class, interface class, and for some of you, for some of your viewers who are familiar with C++ CLI, it's almost the same syntax. Okay. So if you used C++ in the past to uh, target the .NET, this is almost the same syntax. So Got you it. really don't have to learn right. anything here. There's a special kind of pointer that looks. We call it the hat, and there's the the percent mark. So it's really it really is uh, almost the same thing. Okay. All right. So yeah, and uh, people give us this feedback, like you said. Uh, how is Microsoft? Why is Microsoft adding new extensions to the language? And our answer is uh, nicer code, more productive. You're going to be more productive, yes. <laughs> okay. And you don't have to use it if you don't want to. 
uh, your code is going to be more elegant, more readable. Uh, the compiler can give you higher quality error messages and otherwise than, than, than a library solution would have that's given you. That's the one that's most interesting to me. Can you just tell me a tiny bit about that? Yeah, well, the compiler, there is always, every time we add a feature to the language or the library, we always face this choice. Do we have to do it at, as, a, as a library solution or a language solution? And the default always tends to be the library. If you can do it at the library level, you do it at the library level first, right? right? But there are certain advantages of doing it in the language. First of all, uh, you can be more expressive in a language, right? You can, you can, simply, you can simply type less yes. and accomplish more. When the compiler has intimate knowledge of your code, it can produce uh, better quality code and better quality diagnostic. So some of the C++ users are familiar with, with what is known as template, template speed or template, template garbage, right? This is when you have a, uh, a mistake in your C++ code, in your C++ template code, and the compiler just emits pages and pages of uh, incomprehensible gibberish. Right? Mm -hmm. This is an example where a library solution is pretty good, but a compiler solution that had a, that if a compiler solution had a, if a compiler had a better understanding of your code, it would have been possible to give better diagnostics for those cases. Okay. And this is what this is another one of the other reasons why we've introduced. Some library extensions, some uh, language extensions to the to the compiler. All right, cool. Uh, so uh, C plus plus is not typically thought of as a language for GUI programming, but hey, you can do that, and uh, you can write XAML code with C plus plus in the same way as you could have done that with uh, with C sharp. Right? right, but to set the expectations, you aren't going after this market. Mm -hmm. you, you would typically expect people to use XAML with C-sharp, do their UI like that, I think and that then use C++ for you're right, you're right. a part of it. I think that the most common pattern would be to use C++ as right. a, as a okay. lower level backend that does the most of the heavy lifting and uh, some managed language, maybe C-sharp, maybe JavaScript, to do the glue part. All right. We have a sophisticated debugger that allows you to debug direct text, et cetera, et cetera. but uh, let's not go into that into too much detail here. All right. Now, this is, a, this is a subject that is very close and dear to my heart because I worked on that. It's called the Parallel Patterns Library. Uh, and this is a library solution for C++ that aims to make parallel programming in C++ easy and productive, being able to take advantage of all the cores and at the same time write less code. Right, okay, so is this instead of using the vectorizer and parallelizer? This is an alternative to use a vectorizer, right? right. When okay. you start, and we'll talk about that in, a, in a more detail, about how do you use all these technologies, right. uh, but let me just talk about parallelism. Would it be fair to say it? that this approach um, is more work because it's not out of the box, it's I guess? A little bit, it's a little bit more work, but there are some, there is, uh, there are some uh, patterns of code that right. the vectorizer will not be able to parallelize right. because of being overly, well, rightfully so, conservative, right? But with PPL, you can, you can instruct the library to, to parallelize some of the code that you know is safe, right? right? And will I get, obviously, big performance gains this, you get, this, this you approach? Get, you get performance, right? Okay. Uh, ideally, you'll scale to all the available cores that you have on your machine. Okay. So is this like P-Link that we have in C-Sharp? Uh, uh, well, the P-Link is, uh, is, is another library that is built on the, con uh, on, on, on the managed thread pool, actually. Yes. Right? This is, uh, this is built on top of the native concurrency runtime. So the syntax is different, right? And the capabilities are different. Right. But they're both about parallelism, about yeah. taking your code and making it run faster using multiple cores. Yes, okay, great. And there are two kinds of parallelism that we have in, uh, in PPL. One is what we call the structured or fork joint parallelism, where you have a, uh, a piece of work, you partition it into multiple units, then you execute them all in parallel, and then you join them at the end. Parallel invoke is one such example where you have a unit of work, another unit of work, you run them in parallel, you join the result at the end. Parallel for and parallel sort, they all fall into the same category. One of the new things that we're introducing in PPO is called the unstructured parallelism or the task. And this is kind of similar to the future that we've discussed uh, previously, but with a few additions. So let's look into that in more detail. But first I want to talk about the difference between parallelism and concurrency. Many people don't really understand or don't appreciate the difference, but I think it's very important to understand that parallelism is about uh, doing the same work faster, mm -hmm. but putting multiple cores on it. Right. And concurrency can be defined as doing something else while you're doing this work, or doing more work in a given amount of time. 
So if you have, for instance, we have a matrix multiplication uh, mm -hmm. operation, you put more cores on it, mm -hmm. it scales to the number of cores that you have. Uh, now you're writing an email client and you're waiting, you're waiting for the response of this from the server to come back, right? In the meantime, you still want to process the event loop, you still want to make your application responsive. Right. That's concurrency. Oh, uh, okay, all right. They are both about making your application better, if you mm. will, yes. faster, right? But there are different facets to that. Right. And I think uh, the Outlook team should invest in the concurrency model. Oh, I agree. I agree. <laughs> you know what? If I, if, I, if I close the PowerPoint and I go to the task manager, look at my Outlook, how many threads they have, they really shouldn't have that many threads. <laughs> this is a dual-core laptop, so ideally two threads should be sufficient, right? right. But it's just, uh, the problem is just we didn't have enough... Uh, uh, library support, enough compiler support, enough good abstractions to really make that possible. So, okay. uh, to their defense, and yeah. I have a lot of respect for those guys, because Outlook is a program, pro program that, I, that I use every day. This is a difficult problem to solve, and it has been difficult. We're making it easier, uh, but we still have some ways to go. Right, okay, so you'd expect future versions to run on, on future versions of Outlook to run on newer versions of C++, and some of these teams will just pick up huge yeah, benefits. yeah. Uh, mm. we don't pick up huge benefits. Oh, right. Some of the time, uh, they will have to recompile the application, just recompile and yeah. do nothing else. Mm. Uh, in other cases, uh, uh, some re-architecture, re some re-engineering okay. is necessary. Great to hear. So, all right. Uh, let's let's give an, let's look at an example. This is an example from Wikipedia: matrix multiplication. It's a serial serial application. There is nothing really interesting here, but if I try to parallelize it, this is what I do. I simply replace the for loop with a parallel for loop. Right, so we've just got that at, concurrency at the parallel for. Concurrency right. colon colon parallel for. And if you've noticed that, the argument of parallel for is a function or a lambda expression. Right, okay. okay. Uh, and so I just took one uh, for loop, C++ uh, uh, a construct, the for loop, and I turned it into a function called concurrency colon parallel for. And suddenly my matrix, now my matrix multiplication has become faster because it's it using advantage. all cores. It uses it uses all my cores, okay. right? Notice that I've only I've only parallelized the top the top yep. loop. I could have also parallelized other loops, but you have to be very careful with uh, what loops you parallelize and what loops you don't parallelize. For instance, let's look at this example. This is a common bubble sort. This is a common bubble yep. sort, right? This is this is not the fastest uh, sort that you can find, uh, but it's very it's very uh, easy. It's very trivial, and it's a correct application. With PPL, you can easily parallelize it, and you can turn uh, yeah. a correct but slow application into a fast but an incorrect application. And this is an example that shows that yes, PPL gives you that gives you that power to parallelize things. But you also you also have to be very careful, and you also have to understand what is parallelizable and what isn't. So you're saying you've just introduced a bug now? I've just introduced a bug. Yes. Yes. And what's because, the reason? Because the order in which you go through the top loop in this particular algorithm is actually important. And okay. parallelization, by definition, you, you're telling the compiler, just execute those things in any random order that, oh, that you see right. fit. Okay. Or execute them, in fact, in parallel. Right? But if we had good unit tests, we would have discovered that. Oh, absolutely, right. absolutely. Okay. Unit, okay. Test, unit tests would discover that, but there, there aren't any tools out of the box that will look at your problem and say, hey, you have a bug right there. Okay. It's, a, it's a very hard problem to solve, and this is what makes parallelism so hard. So do you guys have any, like uh, when you talk about uh, parallelism, you're going to have bugs that happen in production yeah. with many cores that don't happen in test with, you know, uh, slower yeah, boxes. Yeah, it's possible. it's possible. Do you have any libraries that help with that? Well, obviously, we have very sophisticated tests in Microsoft. So most of, most of the bugs are just, uh, would just be caught by those tests. What about things we can use? Well, there is a, there is a, a thing called the chess. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Microsoft tool that will uh, explicitly inject uh, different uh, permutations into, right. your, into your algorithm. Like picks and models a bit. Uh, uh, yes, and, it, uh, and it, will, it will help to detect, if you have a bug in your program, it will help to, it will stress this program yes. in such a way that this bug will become more evident okay. and make it easier to fix. And which team does, is it called the chess? Uh, it's called the chess, yes. And this, uh, this, uh, this product uh, was in Microsoft Research for a while, and I think they're productizing it now. Yes. Oh, really? Yeah, it's, cool. You, you guys have to look, keep look an eye out. Okay. Yeah, definitely keep an eye on that. But in general, this is a hard problem to solve. Yes. So a developer, uh, we have to teach developers how to what patterns are parallelizable and what not, and um, just good testing and following good practices. 
This is another example uh, that uses, uh, it's called project build. In this example, what I'm using is, imagine that you're building an application such as a Visual Studio, and you have a solution of multiple projects. Uh, first of all, you want to build those projects in the correct dependency order, right? But also taking advantage of all the available cores that you have in your machine. And this is, this is what you can do with tasks. So first of all, you create a task <coughs> that builds the project A, yep. and this, this task can start right away independently as soon as the underlying concurrency runtime can find the resources right. that are available. Likewise, you do with B. And the C, the, the C is interesting because you start C as soon as the project A has finished. Right, so like you see that. this little dot then yeah. function, right? So you can't this, is the the order. this is called the continuation, right? right? You are establishing a dependency between from one task and the other. As soon as A is finished, you are starting a project C. And finally, you have a, you have a project D that depends on both projects A and B. And so you have this uh, AND operator, you're joining A and B together, yeah. and then you're setting up a continuation from that task. That's really nice. That builds D. And quite simple. It's quite simple. And notice mm -hmm. that this is all modern C++, right? There are no functions that take 10 parameters. There are no obscure APIs that you have to use. There aren't any pointers or references. It looks like a very modern it's very readable programming and, and language. not as scary as you would expect. It's absolutely mm -hmm. readable, yes. And this is one of the advantages that C++11 gives you, is this, this expressiveness and this power to express your thought without language getting in the way. All right. And I can step through my code and I can, there's no uh, scary Absolutely. things that you've Absolutely. taken well, away Absolutely. Well, obviously, obviously with debugging parallel code mm. is, is hard because it runs on multiple threads. Mm. So as you're stepping through the code, you wouldn't be, setting, you wouldn't be setting, stepping into a task or out of the task in the same way as you would be doing it. If it, mm. if you, uh, if it were run in parallel. On, on your dev box, can you step through it as though you have 16 cores? Like, can you simulate that you're in that environment? Uh, you, you can, you can. There are some tools that will uh, forcibly create more threads that are, that oh. are necessary. Oh, okay. So you can set up a scheduler with uh, uh, nice. concurrence level 16. Okay. Yeah. And this is how you can okay. uh, potentially uncover some of the bugs. Cool. So I now understand I've got choices to make my app go faster with the vectorizer and parallelizer and my Parallelism and concurrency. Um, have I got anything else? Or oh choices? yes, absolutely. One of the most interesting features that we're adding to uh, Dev11 is called C++ AMP. Okay. This is a little extension to the C++ that, that allows you to take advantage of uh, of the GPU. Okay. And oh, most, okay. most modern computers come Great. with with sophisticated GPU. Uh, uh, Which I GPU get with C sharp. Which you can also get with C sharp, but this is a but this is a language mm -hmm. extension that you don't have. You don't have an equivalent in C sharp, okay. but we are adding it into C plus plus. So in C sharp, I get it for graphics stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll go directly to the GPU, and here I can put business logic to. In, the... in C sharp, there is no there are no language features that will allow right. you to do that. There are several languages. There are several library solutions that will right. uh, like, like that, DirectX, like DirectX and mm -hmm. others that will take that will allow you to take advantage of the ac accelerators, right? Mm -hmm. But this is the language feature, right? In C plus plus. Right. And uh, it is based on DirectX 11, yep. uh, and it takes advantage of any uh, any GPU card that supports DirectX 11, which is okay. most most vendors do that nowadays. So I'm going to use this as an example. Uh, I'm going to use this little agriculture example to demonstrate the uh, to demonstrate the value of the GPU program. Okay. So let's imagine that you and I are farmers, right? And we we, we plow fields. I can imagine that I was once a farmer. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> then you can relate to that hopefully. <laughs> And so manufacturers used to give us a more powerful tractor every year. Like yes. to start with a V6, then the next year they give us a V8, next, next year they give us a V12, and they put a supercharger on it and everything, et cetera, et cetera. So let me tell you, it's very hard to sell a farmer a new tractor. But, but well, I, can, I, can, I can imagine that, right? But at some, point, at some point, it became obvious that you just can't increase the power of the, of the tractors anymore. You could, right. put, you could put a jet engine on it, you could put a mini nuclear plant in it, but it's just not practical, right? right? And so what manufacturers began to do is, instead of giving us a one big beefy tractor, they would give us multiple smaller tractors, right? They could uh, do different jobs. They could do the same job. They could do the same job, but they're smaller tractors, and they would give us two tractors for the price of one, and maybe four tractors for the price of one, right? And our end of the bargain was we had to, first of all, train more tractor drivers, Right. right, and we had to train them not to bump into each other as the plow fields. Oh, okay. Right? Right. That, that, that was a trade-off, but in the end, we could do the job faster, right? Right. So, and that's yeah. the that's the analogy with uh, 
single a single core in kind of uh, advanced at advanced speeds that single cores would give you up until about 2004 2005 with the multi core right okay but now what's happening is uh, another uh, this didn't really work in my scenario because my dad wouldn't let anyone else drive his tractor but okay that's okay. right <laughs> we'll run with it but but the other things that we can do instead of giving you more tractors mm. what if we can just give you a tractor with a bigger plow, with more blades on it, right? Again, it's a trade-off because this tractor is not going to be as nimble, right? You have to use it on a bigger field, but there's some advantages to that in that okay. you don't have to you don't have to train as many tractor drivers. Right? Got it. And that's kind of that's kind of the uh, analogy of CPU versus versus the GPU, right? Modern CPU is the tractor with a V12 engine and supercharger yes. and air conditioning and automating yep. automated trans transmission. And GPU is a tractor with a wide plow with multiple blades on right. it. Right, okay. CPU is very general purpose. It's very good for running all kinds of code, but it's kind of right. it's kind of limited in its ability to parallelize code. You don't have to convince me. I want to use the GPU. It makes great sense to take Perfect. some of the... Perfect. You know some of the work of mm -hmm. the CPU and, and throw it over mm -hmm. the GPU so my can run faster. Yeah, and GPU is different. And GPU that they tend to be they tend to be simpler, mm. and they don't run uh, the same kind of code that a CPU can run. Yeah. For example, there aren't any computers that would boot from a GPU. Right, there are no operating systems that, that can only yeah. run on GPU. But uh, the difference the difference is becoming less and less significant. Okay. So CPU get more vectorization units and they get more uh, more capabilities. And also, GPU become more and more capable. So the, the difference is, is blurring in the in in, uh, in it's going to be they're going to be closer as time goes by, but they're still different, and they will remain different for uh, for foreseeable future. What is C plus plus app, and why you should care? First of all, you will take advantage of the GPU. Yes, got it. Uh, it's cross vendor, right? Really? Any any vendor that supports DirectX 11 hmm. will take advantage of that. Okay. Uh, we've published an open specification. We want to make sure that it runs on any platform, not just Windows, right? So you can go online and download the open spec. And if you are, an, uh, if you are uh, a compiler vendor, you can implement those extensions. So you, you're talking to your we're competitors talking, to- We're talking to competitors, right, yes. To implement this, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. It's modern C++, so it's not, it, you don't have to learn some arcane APIs, you don't have to you know, it's very, it's very, it looks very, very productive. It looks very terse. It looks, it, it's very easy to understand if you look at the code. And uh, the API is really minimal. We've added really just one language feature, which is the restrict modifier, plus a little bit more. But it's just, it's a kind of peripheral thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's future proofed. So in the next, when the next generation of generation of C, uh, GPU become available, uh, this C plus plus amp is designed to take advantage of those those GPUs. Okay. All right. So to wrap this up, I just want to, I've got three choices now to make my mm -hmm. app faster. I can use the vectorizer or the PPL or this uh, C++ amp. How do I make the decision? Which Great one? question. Let's uh, jump straight into the part where I'm explaining just that, right? Okay. All right. You're confused. Okay. And I understand because there are so many different technologies. Just tell me the best one. How to parallel. Them. <laughs> there isn't. Really, there isn't, right? Okay. You have to you have to make a choice. And it all depends on how much time are you willing to invest, right? Uh, if all you have to do, if all you can do is just to recompile your code with uh, Dev11 compiler, then the vectorizer is your, is your choice, right? You recompile your code, and if it becomes faster, great, right? And if you're meeting your performance criteria at that criteria at that point, you can stop right there, okay? And move on to the next problem. Yep. If it doesn't work, then the next choice for you would be the PPL, the Parallel Patterns Library. You can look at your code. There is some there is some work required because you have to re-engineer and re-architect your code. Uh, potentially, mm. it could be hard or not, depending on your application. But if it works out, suddenly your application takes advantage of all the available cores on your machine. Right. And that's great. And you can take a, a, even one one more step, and that's try to use C plus plus C plus plus AMP. Again, it requires some work on your part. But if if it, if, it, if that works, then uh, suddenly you're taking advantage of. Of your GPU, of the GPU cards available on your machine, and that yeah. gives you that can give you spectacular speed ups, maybe hundred x and even more. Well, fantastic! This has been great talking to you, Arthur. Thank you so much. I really, uh, I hope you enjoy your time in Sydney. Absolutely. But uh, I'm very grateful you took a bit of time out to come and speak to me, and I'd like to to uh, 
thank Andrew for me. Uh, Andrew Coates brought you here, yes. so I'm very grateful for that. But thank this you looks very much. great stuff, and I look forward to uh, getting into this when the time's right. Thank you very much for inviting me. Cheers, Arthur. Mm -hmm. And thank you guys. If you have any questions, post them at the bottom, and I'll get a C++ guru or Arthur to answer them for you. Cheers. Mm -hmm.